Hi, I'm Tony Northrup, and this is a free one-hour tutorial for the Canon 5D Mark IV. If you have a different camera, you can go to this URL, stp.io slash tutorials, and we have tutorials for just about every camera out there. You can share that with your friends. First, I'm not going to cover every little menu item and nitpicky thing in the camera. I'm just going to cover those things that I think are valuable to photographers. I'm also not going to go over super elementary aspects of photography because I'm going to assume if you're using this pro body that you at least have some experience with photography. But I will keep in mind that you might be switching over from Sony or Nikon or some other system. So I'll explain some of the basics. If I bore you, Look at the description down below. You can jump ahead to different parts of the video. If you already know everything about the camera, I do have lens recommendations at the end of the video, so you might skip forward to those things. Let's get started. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the battery. It uses the LPE6N battery, which is basically the same battery since the Canon 5D Mark II, so you can continue to use your old batteries if you're upgrading. I just want to mention, go ahead and get at least one more of these I found that a single battery can last you a couple of days of normal travel shooting, or you can probably get through a typical wedding with a single battery. Uh, however, if you're shooting video, it's going to run out faster and you don't ever really want to be stranded. You have to use the battery charger. You can't USB charge these things. And beware of generic non-Canon batteries because they will work, but I find that they work great for mm, some number of weeks, two, three weeks, maybe six weeks, and then they start to die really quickly. So as a result, I simply don't use them anymore. Let's move on to the memory cards. This camera, if you pull this lot back, it has two memory cards, one SD card, one CF card. The CF card is probably going to be your primary card because the CF interface tends to be a little bit faster. However, I strongly encourage you to populate both slots with cards of equal size and the bigger the better and then configure the camera to write to both cards simultaneously because while not everybody has had a memory card failure, maybe most people haven't, they do fail. I've had three, I think, three or four fail over the course of my career. So it happens, and if you're in the middle of a wedding and your card fails, you might end up with a very pissed off uh, family and you might end up losing a client and actually it might impact your career once the reviews come in. If you pick, care about your pictures, use two memory card slots and configure it to write to both. I'll show you how to do that quickly. Once you turn the camera on with this switch there, hit the menu button, and then right, it's the very first thing here uh, under, oops, I forgot, I go tap in the screen. So go to the wrench icon up here, and then on page one, go to record function and card folder selection. And for record function, set that to record to multiple. And you can see now it's recording to both memory cards simultaneously. You'll notice if it plays back, it's playing back from the CF card by default. Uh, if you record video, it will not record to both cards simultaneously. It'll just record to well, probably your CF card. One more point about the memory cards. If you're recording 4K video, the codec that this camera uses is exceptionally inefficient. As a result, 128 gig card like those that I tend to use only stores about 30 minutes of video. So buy bigger cards than you think you might need. Like a 256 gig card would just get you an hour of video. It's definitely not too much. Let's go over the physical ports on the camera. I'm assuming you can figure out the memory card and battery slots okay. Over here on the side, you can see up here at the top, you have a PC sync cord. Hopefully you're not using this anymore. It's a holdover from the early 1910s and 20s, I think. That was common and it's terribly unreliable and it tends to fall out, but you can still trigger just about any flash with it. Pull this over open and you can see your video connectors, the mic jack up here and the headphone jack down here. If you're recording audio, you'll want to be using both of those, and if you're not, then you're probably doing something wrong. The other little rubber sleeve here is covering up your HDMI port and your USB 3 port. This is a mini HDMI port here. You could use it to go out to a field recorder when you record video, however, it only outputs 1080p through the mini HDMI port. It does not output 4K video. So you could use it to monitor something or to record a lower quality feed through a field monitor, but you can't look at your 4K video that way. The other port here is the USB 3 port. That's exceptionally useful for tethering. In our studio, we have a separate video about this, but we connect by USB 3 into a computer running Capture One, and that makes the workflow go much, much faster. If you had a previous Canon, You'll be surprised by this, but the remote 
connector for like a remote sync, uh, a remote trigger, shutter trigger, is here on the front now. That just used to be on the side, now it's on the front. Otherwise, you can still use your same remote triggers if you had a 5D Mark III or an earlier camera. Once you take a picture, uh, I just want to show you quickly, I'm just going to take a picture here. It'll pop up on the screen automatically. You can review it by pressing the play button there. Hit the info button over here in the upper left corner to cycle through different bits of information about it. So you can see if I press it once, it shows me the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, as well as, you know, the format of a large JPEG. And if I push it again, it'll actually show me the histogram, which tells me how bright or dark the picture is. If you don't know what a histogram is, I have a book, Stunning Digital Photography. Chapter 4 will tell you what a histogram is. Um, and that's about what there is to know about uh, reviewing pictures. One thing I really like about these Canon cameras is this rate button. So if I love that picture, let's, you know what, I have some other pictures. Here's some pictures of my kid playing soccer. I'll hit the rate button and press it once and it sets it to one star. So if I think that's a four star picture, I can rate it as four stars. Then when I import it into Lightroom or my other photo editing software, it'll come up as being four stars. That way when you're in the field and you find a picture that you like and you want to remember, you can set it to four or five stars and when you import them, you'll be able to quickly find that picture. I just, it's a simple thing, but I find it really, really, really useful. If you're viewing pictures and you decide you want to delete a picture, of course there's a trash can here. You can press the trash can and then touch erase or scroll over with the scroll wheel. There is an option for changing erase to be the default so you don't have to scroll over every time. And I find that really speeds things up. So I'll show you how to do that now. Hit the menu button. Scroll over to the custom camera settings option here. And then on page four, scroll down to default erase option, select that and set it to erase selected. So with that set, when I review a picture and I hit the erase button, now erase is set by default. So if you need to go through and delete 10 pictures, you can just quickly hit play set, play set, play set, play set, and that will erase those pictures in sequence. It just makes things much faster and easier. Live view. This camera has great live view capabilities. You can start live view at any time by hitting the start stop button here. What this does is it flips up the viewfinder, the, the mirror in the view that sends, there's a mirror in here <laughs> that sends light up here to your viewfinders. And that's what you see when you hold it up to your eye. It flips that out of the way so that the sensor is getting a live feed of the video of, of the world around you. And it shows it on the back screen here. Live view is good on this camera because the live view focusing is really good. So I can just touch the screen here and it should focus it for me. Well, it wants me to push F on. Oh, I see it's okay. So you can touch to focus the screen. You can also push AF on to focus. Just like when you're reviewing a picture, you can press the info button multiple times to view different bits of information. So if I am in my view, I really like to have the histogram on because that tells me more about the exposure. So by looking at the histogram here, I can see, well, nothing's in the right quarter of the histogram. So I know it's a little underexposed and I can just crank up the exposure compensation here and see the changes in real time to both the preview and to the histogram. Live view is really terribly useful. I will warn you though, because there's no articulating screen, if you get down low to the ground or over your head, it can be a little bit hard to see. Um, one way to work around that is to hook up your phone's Wi-Fi app so you can get a stream of real time data to your phone. I'll show you how to use the Wi-Fi app in just a little bit. As I demonstrated earlier, this camera has a touch screen and it's kind of the first for the 5D series, which is why I wanted to mention it. You can interact with menus and of course touch the focus. I'll show you the Q menu here. See the Q button? It takes you to a lot of just really useful kind of quick settings that you might frequently change. So you can get to these through other shortcut buttons too, but it's, it's handy to remember that Q button is there, especially if you're unfamiliar with the camera. Like if I want to change from one shot focusing to servo, I can do that by just pressing the Q button and uh, making those changes. I could also quickly change to change, you know, my JPEG settings for the different memory cards. There you go. Just switch to raw all by using the touch screen. Um, if you're an experienced photographer, you might not be accustomed to using the touch screen, but I strongly encourage you to give it a shot, like try it out and get used to it in particular it's really useful for reviewing pictures because I might need to make sure that I got this sharp picture. 
and with the older 5Ds, you had to hit the little magnify button over here and then zoom way in. And this is just so much faster to zoom right in and pan around. And then I could just switch to a previous picture and pan around and make sure that I got the shot. Trust me, once you get to use the, once you become in the habit of using the touch screen, you're going to really appreciate it. I want to talk a bit about Canon's ITR feature. ITR is intelligent tracking and recognition. This is a feature that I think is new to the 5D series, but it's been in like the 7D Mark II and the Canon 1DX Mark II and 1DX original. It will spot a subject that you focused on and then follow it as it moves across the frame. So if a subject moves from the right side of the frame to the left side of the frame, it can track it. I want to make a couple of points about it. It's turned on by default and it's configured to find faces by default. So you don't need to turn it on. And I, I suggest leaving it on the default. However, we'll talk about focusing groups in a little bit. It only works when you have uh, the group AF or uh, full all, auto, all autofocus points turned on. So you cannot use ITR with a single autofocus point or with a, a small group of autofocus points, only with the larger groups of autofocus points. And to me, that kind of limits the usefulness of it. I just wanted to save you the time of trying to figure out how that feature actually works. Something that causes a lot of problems for people is the diopter. The diopter is like an ability to dial in a glasses prescription into your viewfinder. So if you're a glasses wearer, you can take your glasses off and hold this up and see everything sharp. I'm wearing contacts right now, but when I don't have my contacts in, I really like to use it. The diopter is located here, just to the, on, the, on the right side of the viewfinder. So what you'll want to do is hold the camera up to your eye, make sure you have live view turned off, and look at the numbers at the bottom. Don't look through the viewfinder because things might be out of focus, but rather look at the, the numbers like the ISO number and turn that diopter until everything is nice and sharp. If you change the diopter and you hand the camera to somebody else, everything's going to be blurry. If you pick up your camera and it seems like the camera won't focus or everything is blurry, check the diopter. It sometimes get, gets hit accidentally, but a lot of people think their camera's broken, like they can't get anything to focus anymore. And it's really just a little twist of the diopter. Let's talk about aperture priority. Now, because this is a pro grade camera, I'm going to assume that you know the basics of when you should use aperture, shutter priority, manual mode, etc. But maybe you're coming from Nikon, where the mode buttons work a little bit different. The 5D series has a mode dial over here. And you can see TV here stands for shutter priority. I'm going to push this center button in and then twist that over to AV, which is aperture value, it's aperture priority. You can see when you don't have this button pushed in, you can't twist it. So when you do want to twist it, you have to push it in and twist it like that. This button used to get hit all the time in the original 5D, so it was a real godsend when they added in that extra button. If you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about f-stops and aperture, visit this URL, stp.io slash f-stop, and I'll walk you through the whole process, or check out chapter four of my book, Stunning Digital Photography. Quickly, aperture priority gives you direct control over the f-stop allowing you to use a small f-stop number, which equates to a large opening of the lens, or a high f-stop number, which gives you a little small opening on the lens. Once you have the mode dial set to AV, you will use the main dial here to change the aperture. So if we look at the LCD screen on this top here, we can see now it's set to f2.8. You know what? I will turn on, I'll hit info here to show the information on the back of the screen because it's easier to see. So now it's set to f2.8 here. I can turn the dial to the right and use a higher f-stop number, or to the left to use a smaller f-stop number. You can't touch the info screen for some reason, so you still have to use the main dial there. This is a demonstration of how it might impact your pictures. Wide open with a small f-stop number. You can see Chelsea there on the left. The background is extremely blurred. As we use higher f-stop numbers, the background starts to become clear providing more context to the image, but perhaps adding more distracting elements in as well. Talk about shutter priority. As I mentioned earlier, it's indicated by TV on the mode dial here, rather than S, as in every other camera system. Once you switch to TV, the main dial here changes personalities, whereas before this changed the aperture, now it changes the shutter speed. That's different from other camera systems. So you can see by scrolling to the right, I can go all the way up to one eight thousandths of a second, or I can scroll to the left to go down and down, down, and one quote mark means one full second. Six quote marks means six seconds, and it will go all the way up to 30 seconds. 
kind of an arbitrary limit. If you want to know more about shutter speed and shutter priority, visit this URL, sdp.io slash settings. But to quickly demonstrate, the reason you might want to control it is to either show or freeze motion in your picture. Three pictures of my daughter here on the left, you can see at one eighth of a second, she's on one of these spinning merry-go-rounds. At one eighth, the background's very blurry. At one thirtieth, the background is showing some detail, but there's still some blur. And then when I switch to one one twenty-fifth, we're still moving, but the background is completely frozen. That's the kind of situation where you want to pull out shutter priority, like sports and action and that kind of thing. Manual mode gives you control over both your shutter speed and your aperture simultaneously. To select manual mode, push in the center button on the mode dial here and switch over to M. Now, the main dial here gives you control over your shutter speed, just like it did in shutter priority. To control your aperture, you'll use the secondary dial here on the back. And those are the important settings. Now, you might notice that you now can't change your exposure compensation. Exposure compensation does matter because you have auto ISO. Um, what you can do is to switch back into, say, aperture priority mode and then move the secondary dial. So here you can see I'm adding in exposure compensation. I'm at plus two stops. If I go back to manual mode now, it will retain that increased exposure compensation. So if you are using auto ISO in manual mode and you want exposure compensation, switch over to shutter priority or aperture priority, use the secondary dial to dial that exposure compensation in and then switch back to manual mode. That's different from some earlier Canon cameras. I'm gonna give you a couple of links here in case you wanna dive deeper into a specific topic of photography. If you wanna know more about night photography, visit this link, sdp.io slash NP. If you want to know more about landscape photography, visit sdp.io slash ls. If you want to know more about wildlife, visit sdp.io slash wl. Covered that already. For more information about manual mode, visit sdp.io slash go manual. Bulb mode allows you to use shutter speeds longer than 30 seconds. To use bulb mode, set the mode dial here from M over to B. B is bulb mode. And now what it will do is it will keep the shutter open for as long as you hold your finger on the shutter button here. That seems weird. You wouldn't want to do a one minute exposure by holding your finger like this for one minute, right? Chances are good you'd shake the camera and you'd probably get bored. So in those cases, the most likely thing that you'll do is to pull off this cover here and hook up your remote shutter timer. Canon makes a remote shutter timer, but it's way overpriced. Uh, like the shutter timer I usually use, I would just go to Amazon and search for Canon 5D remote shutter timer and pick up one of the ones that's under 20 bucks. There's not a particular name for them because there's a Chinese manufacturer that makes them, but they resell them under a bunch of different brands. So typically they're under 20 bucks and that's what I've used for more than a decade. They work just fine. You can pick up a shutter timer that works for earlier 5Ds, like the 5D Mark II or the original 5D, and it should work just fine. I'm going to take one minute and just plug my books. I have a bunch of books. Stunning Digital Photography is perfect if you're trying to learn the art and science of photography. I'm telling you how to use the buttons on your camera, but that doesn't teach you about the important aspects of photography, like mood and expression and lighting and storytelling. I cover all that in photography and dig deep into specific topics like portraits and weddings and wildlife and landscapes. Even things like HDR and underwater photography, macro photography, I cover all that here. And it comes free with 14 hours of video training. So if you're not into books, you can just watch the 14 hours of video. It's, the ebook is 10 bucks. So that's incredibly cheap for that much video training, not to mention the actual book. Lightroom is the way that I do most of my post-processing and organize my pictures. You're probably already using Lightroom if you have a 5D. If you want to learn how to actually get the most out of Lightroom, check out my Lightroom book. Like this book, it comes with 14 hours of video. That's a ton of video training. Goes well to complement the book itself. Photoshop for the heavy lifting when you really need to make a picture perfect in post. I have a book on Photoshop now, and like the other books, it's a full book, but it also comes with 10 hours of video training, and it's an awesome price. And if you have questions about which lens, tripod, studio lighting, or just about any other type of gear to get, check out my photography buying guide. This is the big boy. It's a really big fat book. You can get them all at 
Amazon or just about any other bookstore, or you can order them direct from us. We ship worldwide at sdp.io slash store. The ebooks start at 10 bucks and the paperbacks are just a little bit more. Let's talk about the different shutter modes. By default, the camera will come in single shutter mode, and that means when you push the button, let's switch over to program mode here, it's just gonna take one picture. To set it to continuous mode, hit the drive button up here, the second button, and then click, uh, click the secondary dial here until you'll see, looks like a stack of copies and then an H. <laughs> that turns you into continuous mode. And now as long as you hold the shutter down, it will keep firing up until the point when it fills its buffer. So you can see it stopped firing there. That's because it, it filled its buffer. If you get frustrated because it fills its buffer too quickly, there are a couple of things you can do. For one, you could just switch from RAW to JPEG. JPEG files are smaller, they store faster, therefore you won't run out of buffer as quickly. The other option is to get faster cards. If you're writing to both memory cards, it's gonna buffer even faster than normal, so you could write to one card as well, though again, you take that risk that that card will fail. Get, both, get fast cards for both slots, and that will increase the number of shots you can get consecutively before it starts to buffer. There are some other shutter modes, and I'll use the, the back screen here. Uh, when I push the drive button, and then use the secondary dial here, you can see there's continuous high and continuous low. Continuous low sounds like this. Because sometimes seven frames a second, the continuous high speed is a little bit too fast. You don't wanna necessarily take all that many pictures. You can also do silent single shooting, and that's a misnomer because it's not actually silent, but it is quieter. So that's perfect if you're shooting a wedding and it's at that quiet part of the ceremony and you don't wanna disturb people, or if you're a photojournalist and you're shooting some sort of scene where you wanna be as discreet as possible, things like street photography, silent shooting is perfect for that. There's also a silent continuous shooting mode, which keeps shooting as long as you hold the, your finger on the shutter. And two self timers, one 10 second self timer and one two second self timer. The 10 second self timer is for those times when you put the camera on a tripod, and then you go run around behind your family and put your arm around them and everybody smiles. Uh, the two second self timer is good for when you have the camera on a tripod. You have live view to lock the mirror open and you wanna get the sharpest picture possible because it will, the two second delay will eliminate any shake you introduce to the camera by pressing the shutter button. Uh, rather than do the uh, 10 second timer, I'm gonna show you how to use the interval timer in just a second. But first, let's talk about focusing modes. That was the shutter modes. Now we'll do the focusing modes. It's on the same button, however. You can see it says Drive AF. So I'll push that same button here. And now I can switch, use the main dial to switch between three different modes. One shot, AI focus. Oh, I touched it. I always forget it has a touch screen. One shot, AI focus, and AI servo. One shot seeks focus and then freezes as soon as it finds focus. AI servo continues to seek out uh, sharp focus on a subject, even though it's moving. Now, on low-end cameras, like the T6 or T5, I would use one shot for almost anything. On this camera, this camera has a fantastic focusing system. It's amazing. Therefore, I use continuous focusing all the time. Because the fact is, as long as you're hand-holding the camera, there's always a little bit of movement. Your body can move forward or back a little bit. And if you're using fast lenses with shallow depth of field, you will find some shots are out of focus just because your body shifted forward or back or maybe your portrait subject shifted forward or back. I just find that I get a higher hit rate when I'm using AI servo. Therefore, I just use that all the time. For more information about focusing modes, visit sdp.io slash focus. Now let's talk about focusing areas because the camera can be configured to focus on a very small point or to focus anywhere across a big frame. And for most pro photographers, you're actually going to want to tell the camera where to focus. <laughs> Beginning cameras, beginners are, don't, don't want to deal with it, so they're happy to let the camera just kind of pick a focus point. But for me, I always want to tell the camera where to focus. So the way you'll do that is by using this button here, this kind of nondescript button that has like crosshairs in it. So as I push that, look at the back display again, you can see now it's showing me all the different focusing options that I have. So Push that and, uh, all right. And um, this is weird. 
there's a, another button here next to the main dial labeled M F N. So push your focus area selector and then push M F N multiple times to iterate through the different options. This is what I use almost all the time, which is spot AF. Spot AF is a very precise focusing point. It focuses on a very small area. And it's almost always what I want, especially with things like portraiture. It's critical that you focus right on the eye and not on the forehead or the eyebrow or even the eyelashes. Therefore, you want the smallest focusing point possible. And focusing is very precise and very fast in that mode. So that's pretty much what I use. However, a, you can also select a bigger focusing point or a expanded area AF where you can focus on something and then it will kind of uh, focus, well, it focuses on a broader area. And, you know, some valid reasons to use some of these expanded area AF or a full zone AF where you can use ITR. Some of the valid reasons for that are if you're following a moving subject like a flying bird against a blue sky, it can be difficult to put a small focusing point on a moving subject like that. It's much easier if you tell the camera, focus anywhere in this area. That way, if your long telephoto lens moves just a hair, the camera won't lose focus. It'll, it'll lock on that subject. So for me, I almost always use that spot AF, but then when I'm actually tracking moving subjects, I'll expand it and make my life just a little bit easier. To move the focusing point, I kind of demonstrated this already, but you can just use this thumbstick here. And it's a great thumbstick. It, they inherited it from the 1DX Mark II, and it's better than was in the other 5Ds. You can see the same kind of information mirrored when you have your eye up to the viewfinder. This camera gives you a lot of control <laughs> over the focusing behavior. You can tune it by hitting the menu button and then scrolling over to the AF menus over here and the very first page here. You'll see by default they provide three different cases. Case one is the default, versatile multi-purpose setting. Case two continues to track subjects but ignores possible obstacles. And that can be useful if you're shooting a football game or a soccer game and you focus and you're tracking somebody but then a defensive player runs in front of them, it will ignore this sudden obstruction rather than quickly focusing on it. It requires a bit of intelligence, right? Because it could just decide to focus on whatever appears in front of you and end up screwing up your shot. So that's good when you want it to ignore things. Case three here instantly focuses on subjects suddenly entering the area AF. And that's good for times when you want it to focus no matter what, uh, you want it to focus where your focusing point is, no matter what, without any delay. Now, if one of those cases doesn't exactly meet your needs, you can go through, go scroll down even lower, and specifically configure the tracking sensitivity, the acceleration and deceleration tracking, and the AF point auto switching, the AF point auto switching, as it, as it tracks a subject across the frame, from, say, the left side of the frame to the right side of the frame. So with all that said, I shoot a lot of sports and wildlife, a lot of action, and I've never found that it helps to change those settings. I have spent lots of times to a lot of, a lot of time tuning them, but whenever I tune them, I always end up a little frustrated with it, and I end up switching back to the default. So I wanted to tell you where it is, but I also encourage you just like not to sweat it. Give the default settings a try, and only if you feel like the AF system isn't behaving up to your expectations should you go in and tune it, because it's it's probably going to be fine. Let's talk about talk about how to change the ISO and. The, the ISO is the camera's sensitivity to light, basically. If you're in a dim conditions, you would use a high ISO, like ISO 6400. If you're in bright sunlight, you'd probably use ISO 100. If you want more information about ISO, including why I'm saying ISO and not spelling out ISO, visit this URL, sdp.io slash ISO. To set the ISO on this camera, there's a button on the top. So I'll just hit that ISO button there. And then I can use the main dial to select the ISO. That's all there is to it. If I scroll all the way to the left, it will use auto ISO. There is no shame in using auto ISO. <laughs> I use some form of auto exposure almost all the time. I will often be in manual mode, specifying both my shutter speed and my aperture, but relying on the camera to determine the exposure using auto ISO. The camera's auto exposure system is really fast and really intelligent. I just find I have a higher hit rate when I use auto ISO. Let's talk about exposure compensation. I mentioned it earlier. 
you can use exposure compensation in either aperture priority or shutter priority mode by simply moving the secondary dial here down low and the picture will become darker, up high and the picture will become brighter. For more information about exposure compensation, visit sdp.io slash ec. Closely related to exposure compensation is bracketing. So to turn on bracketing, you actually have to go into the menu system. That's different from some other cameras, but I'll hit menu here. And let's go over to the camera icon, page two, expo comp slash AEB. Canon's menu naming isn't always crystal clear. I'll hit the set button. And now what you see is a kind of an exposure compensation diagram. And if I move the main dial here, it will split off and show this lower line here. And what it's saying now is it's going to take three pictures at three different exposures. One at negative two stops, one at the, what it thinks the proper exposure is, and then one at two stops overexposed. Now, if I want the whole thing to be more exposed, I can use the exposure compensation dial. Anyway, the, the visual there is really, really useful. Once you've set it, don't just hit the shutter button or it will forget all your settings. Hit the set button here. As it, if you forget to hit set, I do it all the time. It forgets it, but I'll take three pictures now. And as I review those three pictures, you can see properly exposed, underexposed, and overexposed. When you're done with exposure compensation, you'll have to go back in and turn it off manually. Three stops exposure compensation is usually enough, especially when I'm shooting raw, because this camera has a great dynamic range. You can also bracket at five stops of exposure compensation. So hit the menu button, and then under the custom settings icon up here, page one, you'll see bracketing number of bracketed shots. So if you select that, you can choose three shots, two shots, five shots, or seven shots. Often just to be safe, I'll bracket at actual at five stops and get even more pictures taken. You can also turn on bracketing auto cancel in case you always want to automatically cancel bracketing after your first time. Anytime I do turn on bracketing, I tend to take three or four different scenes bracketed. So I don't use the bracketing auto cancel normally, but maybe you do and I wanted you to know where it is. Let's talk about Wi-Fi on this camera. This camera supports Wi-Fi that will allow you to transfer pictures from the camera over to your smartphone so that you can share them online a little more quickly. It's not the best. <laughs> Most people, I think, try out the Wi-Fi app and then probably never use it again. Or maybe use it once or twice, but you don't use it on a regular basis. It's kind of laborious, and as you'll see, the smartphone app is not up to par with other smartphone apps that you might have on your phone. Uh, but I will show you how to use it. So hit the menu button here, and it's, it's really poorly named. Turning on Wi-Fi is not easy, but you'll see under the wrench icon, page four, communication settings. You'd think Canon might call it Wi-Fi or something, they call it communication settings. So we'll select built-in wireless settings, Wi-Fi NFC, and then enable. And now we have Wi-Fi enabled. Uh, we can also scroll down a couple. And if I select this option, well, I had to connect to the smartphone first. Okay. So now I have my smartphone out. This camera does support NFC. So if you have an Android phone that supports NFC, you should be able to just rub it. Okay. It connected in. If you have an iPhone or a NFC is not working for you, you will have to open up your Wi-Fi settings. The way it works is the camera creates a wireless access point, usually named 5D4, and oh, Wi-Fi got turned off somehow. Now you'll need to turn on Wi-Fi on your camera. Under communication settings, built-in wireless settings, go to Wi-Fi function, select connect to smartphone, and then connect. Connect to device, okay. A lot of unnecessary steps. Now, the little blinky thing up here will show Wi Fi is on. The camera is now acting as a wireless access point without internet access, but nonetheless a wireless access point. So, if you have NFC on your phone, you can tap it here and it should automatically connect in. Otherwise, if you don't have NFC, like if you have an iPhone, you have to open up your wireless Wi Fi settings and connect to the smartphone network. 
So here you can see it's called EOS 5D4 and then some random numbers that it assigned. So I'll select that and I'll click connect. This disconnects you from your internet. Even if you're using a cellular connection, you usually can't get to the internet at this point. So you have to transfer the pictures over. Now that I'm connected, I can switch back to the Canon Connect app. Presumably you've installed this from your app store and remote shooting allows me to see through the camera. That's mostly useful if the camera is far away from you. If you put it on a tripod and you want to be able to compose the shot, you can touch the refocus here. Take pictures and do things like uh, change the shutter speed, etc. Overall, it gets the job done for remote shooting. For me, usually what I'm doing is I'm transferring pictures from the camera to my phone so I can share them on Instagram or Twitter. Press images on camera there. And what it will do is browse through all the latest pictures. Um, some of them you'll see are labeled raw and you can still transfer those fortunately. So you can select that and then tap this down here, the little phone with an arrow icon, tap that and it will transfer it to your phone. Now this is, it's weird because there's no share button. So you want to put this on Twitter or something, you'll have to actually open up the app separately and browse for it and then you'll find it alongside your regular smartphone pictures. Generally, you'll want to keep Wi-Fi off and like I said, it's a little bit of a clumsy thing. Another option, if you find that frustrating, is you can get memory card readers like SD or CF memory card readers that connect into your smartphone, Android or iOS, and then you can use Lightroom Mobile to import them from the memory card. Sometimes that's easier than fussing with Wi-Fi. Now let's talk about RAW. I almost always shoot RAW images. RAW images capture all the data from the camera sensor, including details like details captured in highlights or shadows that are lost when you say when the camera saves the files as a JPEG. JPEG is the default, however, so I recommend everybody go in and turn on RAW. And to do that, you'll go to the very first page here. It's so important they make it the very first thing. Select that and now by using either the main dial or the secondary dial here, you can record, choose whether it records RAW, JPEG, or both RAW and JPEG. Generally, I just used RAW and no JPEG. For detailed information about why you might want to use RAW, visit stp.io slash raw v jpeg. This camera also features dual pixel raw, a first for any Canon camera. You could turn it on from the same menu, camera icon, page one, the second item down here, selecting enable here. I will warn you though, I find absolutely no value in using dual pixel raw. We tested it thoroughly. We could not create a real world scenario where it actually helped the situation. And enabling dual pixel raw includes several negative side effects, including your maximum frame rate drops from seven frames a second to five frames a second. It also doubles the size of your files, meaning they take up twice as much storage, they take longer to write, they take longer to import, and processing them will be slower too. Uh, another downside to using dual pixel raw is the only way to make dual pixel raw changes is to use the Canon software, the Canon Digital Photography Professional software on your PC or Mac, and unanimously everybody hates that software. <laughs> I am not going to go into more detail about Dual Pixel Raw. We do have a review and examples on our channel if you want to search for that. Otherwise, I will just say, go ahead and turn it off and just leave it off. This camera includes several different metering modes, and I always leave it in the default metering mode because I'm always very happy with that. If you want to use a different metering mode, metering is the camera's logic for determining how bright or dark the picture should be. There's this button here, the first button you can see. The symbol for metering is universally this weird circle with a dot in it. So push that and now I can use the main dial to switch between evaluated metering, which is the default and very logical, um, partial metering, metering, spot metering, or center weighted average. These are kind of holdovers from the film era. That's the way I feel about it. If you are an old film shooter and you know how to use spot metering and you're more comfortable with that, by all means use it. For everybody else, I recommend just using evaluative metering and then adjusting with exposure compensation as needed. 5D Mark IV does not include a built-in flash. However, you can connect an external flash 
And if you do, you might want to know how to change the flash exposure compensation to make it brighter or darker. It's the third button here. So I'll push that button. And now by using the secondary dial, I can add flash exposure compensation. The symbol is lightning bolt plus or minus. That's universal. So I can dial that up or I can dial it down to output less flash. For me, I like TTL, but I find it almost always puts out too much flash and it blinds people and washes out their faces. I'd rather use more ambient light. So as a result, I tend to dial in about negative one and a third stops of flash exposure compensation and just kind of leave it there. You can change the white balance settings on this camera and that won't make any real difference if you're shooting raw. But if you're shooting JPEG, you might want to get it right. I find the auto white balance just generally works the best. Anytime I try to fuss with it, I end up forgetting it and screwing up a bunch of shots. So it's something I never really change. But if you do want to change it, it's the first button here. You'll see WB. So you push that. And then the secondary dial here will allow you to browse through all the different white balance options. If you don't know what I'm talking about when I say white balance, you probably shouldn't sweat it. But if you do want to understand, Go to chapter three in my book, Stunning Digital Photography, because I do cover it in there. Let's talk about video capabilities on this camera. To record video, you'll take this dial here and switch it over to the video camera. You'll see Live View will automatically pop up. You can iterate through different amounts of information on the screen by hitting the info button here. This camera features both HD and 4K video. If you record in HD, which is like 1080p, um, it can go up to 60 frames a second, and it will record the full width of the frame. If you record in 4K video, which is kind of everybody's favorite, it has about a 1.7x crop, but it's also going into, um, that's like true 4K, which is a little bit wider than the type of 4K that you're watching when you watch this video on YouTube. It's 4096 pixels wide, as opposed to 3840 pixels wide. So just... I'm mentioning that because if you are shooting 4K and your destination format is 3840, you will have to keep in mind that you have to crop off a bit of this off the sides. So don't compose too tight. Leave yourself a little bit of room for cropping. To change your video format, hit the menu button here and go over to camera icon, page four. Scroll down to Movie Recording Quality and select that. Now, Movie Recording Size, select that. You can see by default it's set to FHD, which is Full HD. That's 1080p. If you want 4K, you'll scroll up to 4K and then either 23.98 frames a second, 24 frames a second, basically, or 29.97, which is basically 30 frames a second. 24 frames a second is more typical for film, and 30 frames a second is more typical for video and TV. So I'll select that. And so now when I turn it on now, I just want to show you the amount of crop that you get here. This is live view for a still photo. You can see the size of that video slide. As I switch to video, it crops in substantially. So that's something you really need to be aware of if you are switching from stills to video on a regular basis. There's a significant crop factor. It gets much, much tighter. As a result, a zoom lens is useful, so you can always zoom back. You might also have to plan different lenses, and the lens I like to use for video is the Canon 16-35 to f4. It's great for video because it's super wide. The 16 here basically becomes about 24 millimeters, so it's much more zoomed in than you might expect. This lens also has image stabilization, which can really help out in handheld situations. And that's about what you should know for video. Of course, the onboard mic isn't that great, so you want to uh, connect in an external microphone. I'll have a suggestion for you. And you'll want to use headphones just to make sure there's no problems with your external microphone. As I mentioned earlier, the file sizes are massive. They're absolutely massive. So not only do you want a bigger memory card to record those huge files, but when you do import them onto your computer, the first thing you want to do is probably transcode it down to a smaller file size. And then if you don't have the extra storage, actually get rid of the original files. We use VidCoder to transcode these massive motion JPEG files down to a more reasonable uh, codec. And that kind of makes life much easier. This camera also includes GPS, the global positioning system, which can find your place anywhere on the planet. 
and then tag your pictures with it. And this is awesome because when you tag your pictures with GPS, you can import them into Lightroom and then go to the map tab and see the location of all the different pictures that you've taken. It means that if you think, oh, I need to find that picture that I took in Boston, you can pull up the map and then zoom in on a map and actually find the exact street that you were on. It makes it easier to find pictures and it's also just kind of cool. If you're a landscape photographer and you want to revisit a location, even if you were on a hike or something, you can actually pull that information out and find your way back to that spot. I've also found that GPS does not use that much battery. Uh, I kept it on for an entire week of traveling and didn't have any problems. To turn on GPS, so basically I just turn on GPS and I just leave it. So I'll, I'll hit the menu button here. And then I need to go over to this wrench icon. And it's on page four, right above communication settings is GPS settings. So I'll select that. Select GPS. And I'll turn it on to mode two. Mode one keeps the GPS on all the time, even when the camera's turned off. So it's going to burn through a lot more batteries. Mode two is a little more sensible. It only picks up GPS signals when the camera is on. But that means that there might be a little bit of lag. It might not immediately get a GPS signal the first time you turn it on. So I have it on mode two and you can see there are some other options here like the position update interval. Um, 15 seconds is generally okay with me. Um, to save some batteries I will even lengthen it because I'm usually not moving that fast when I'm taking pictures and every one minute might reduce the battery usage by four factor um, but still be good enough for me. And you can also turn on a GPS logger if you absolutely want to this doesn't change the fact that whether or not you have the GPS logger on, it's going to be saving your GPS data to your pictures. The GPS logger just literally saves a log of your GPS location. And you could open that up later and actually see the path where you walked, even if you weren't taking pictures. I, if you actually want that, I would instead suggest that you get a smartphone app and run it from your smartphone so that you're not killing your, your camera's batteries. And smartphone apps will actually show it on the map and be a little more useful for you. Now I'll show you the interval timer. The interval timer will take pictures on a regular basis and that's terribly useful for doing time lapses uh, or if you're stitching together a long exposure by using a technique like image averaging, the interval timer is just perfect. I also prefer the interval timer for situations where uh, I need to be in the photo, where I would need to set the camera up and on a tripod and then run around behind my family. I'll set the interval timer to take 10 pictures that way you don't have to keep running back and hitting the shutter button again and again. So to activate the interval timer, hit the menu button. And it's over on the camera icon. Page four, interval timer. Select that. It's set to disable by default. So I'll select enable. And this is confusing. <laughs> um, don't hit your shutter button or it will forget your settings. Instead, you'll need to hit set. But before you do that, you'll need to hit the info button. You can see it says info detail set. Hit the info button here and select the interval. So for me, if I'm taking a self portrait, I usually have it fire off one shot every five seconds. And I'll set the number of shots to say, take 20 shots. And then I'll scroll down to okay. So now I've set those options. And whether or not you set the options, when you select enable, you need to be sure to hit set. Hit set when you're done because if you hit the shutter, the interval timer will not be enabled. Now, when I hit the shutter button, it will fire the first shot right away and then wait five seconds and fire the next shot again up until it takes the number of shots that I told it to. If I want to cut it off early, I'll just turn the camera off. Mirror lockup is a technique a lot of us used in the earlier days to reduce the amount of vibration. Every time you take a picture with an SLR using the viewfinder, the mirror has to flip up and that can shake the camera a little bit, reducing your sharpness, especially on high megapixel bodies like this. The new technique that I prefer is just use live view. So just hit that start stop button there. Turn the camera on first, hit the start stop button. This flips the mirror up, eliminating that. And it gives you the ability to more precisely focus and frame your shot by giving you a live feed through it. So just use that instead of mirror lockup. There's still the option for mirror lockup, but I, I can't imagine a reason to use it anymore. When you filled up your memory cards, you will want to format them so you can reuse them. Of course, when you filled up your memory cards and then transferred them over someplace safe, like your computer with an active backup. To format your memory cards, this is something I do regularly. 
go to the wrench icon, page one, and then the last option here is format card. You'll have to select which of the two cards you want to format and then select OK to actually format it. Now, if you accidentally format your card and you did not mean to, if there are still pictures on there that you need, here's a useful tool, photo rec. Go to scp.io slash photo rec, like photo recover. That's a free tool for Windows, Mac, Linux, just about anything that will go through your memory card and recover any files that it happens to find. Because when you format the card, it's like ripping out the table of contents from a book. All the pages are still there. It's just you have to go through one page at a time to find it. So it does that for you, saves all your pictures onto your computer, and it can be a lifesaver. If you search for image recovery software, Google will give you a bunch of options that cost like 50 bucks or more. They pretty much all use the same free tool. So save your money. Just use the free photo rec tool. I've used it a bunch of times. It's great. One thing I hate about all cameras is they come with a beep turned on by default. I hate that because I'm a wedding photographer and you know when the church is quiet and Uncle John is holding up his little little uh, Canon camera and it's beeping as it focuses. Beep, 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 beep. It's so annoying. Um, though actually this camera hasn't been beeping so maybe it's not turned on by default. But I'll show you how to turn it off just in case it is on. Camera, page one and the menu item. Go down to the fourth item down here. Beep, it says enable. Set it to disable because nobody wants to hear the beep. <laughs> Back button focus is one of my favorite techniques. Back button focus separates focusing from the shutter button. So by default, when you push the shutter button halfway, the camera will focus. Everybody kind of expects that, but experienced people have many situations where you want to take a picture, but you do not want the camera to automatically focus. Back button focus links the AF on button here with the focusing behavior and the shutter button turns it off. So when you want to take a picture without focusing, you don't push the AF on button. When you do want to focus, you push the AF on button. If you want more information about why you should use back button focus, visit this link, sdp.io slash ybb. Now I'll show you how to actually configure it on this camera. I'll hit the menu button here and I've got to scroll all the way right over to the custom settings menu here. It's this camera with lines under it and scroll over to the right some more. Down to page three, select the last option here, which is custom controls. So I'll select that and this allows you to change the behavior of the buttons. And it's kind of limited in the camera, Canon cameras, but one of the useful things you can do is enable back button focus. So I'll select the shutter button here and press set. And by default, you'll see it's set to metering and AF start. I'm gonna set it to just metering start. So in other words, I'm turning off AF start from the shutter button. Now I'll scroll down to AF on and make sure that's set to metering and AF start. Here's a bonus that you get with the newer Canon cameras. This little asterisk button here, which is normally AAE lock, I never use that. Instead, what I'll do is I'll configure it to do a different type of AF start. So I'll select that asterisk there and I'll select metering and AF start just like I did before, but I'll hit the info button. You see it says info detail set. So I'll hit that. And now I can select the exact behavior of that AF start button when I push that. And what I'm gonna do is, I almost always want AF, AI servo, because that's awesome. So I'll set that. And the way I like to configure it is I set it, the AF on and the asterisk for different area selection modes. So I'll select AF area selection mode here. And for the asterisk, I tend to use auto selection AF the widest range of focusing points. So that will allow the camera to decide where to focus. So I'll set that. And now I'll go back and edit the AF on button here. I'll hit the info to change the settings and I'll set the AF on button to do the spot AF. So now when I want spot AF, a tiny little small precise focusing point, I'll push AF on. When I want to focus anywhere, I'll push the asterisk here. That's changed the way I do wildlife photography, especially. If there's a bird perched in a tree and there's all sorts of tw twigs and leaves that I need to avoid focusing on, I'll use the spot AF and put the AF point right on the bird's eye. If there's a flying bird and I'm using a big telephoto lens and it's kind of hard to keep the spot AF on, 
I'll just move my thumb over a little bit and I'll hit the asterisk instead, allowing the camera to find the bird anywhere in the frame. The fact that I don't have to go in and change settings is incredibly, incredibly useful. So thank you, Canon, for building that in. The menus are incredibly confusing and also poorly named. <laughs> One thing you can do to make it much, much easier is to set up your own custom My Menu. My Menu just has those, those menu settings that you use on a regular basis. And it's the last menu item here, the little, as, the little star. And the first thing you'll do is select Add My Menu Tab. So your menu will have tabs and then each tab can have items. So we'll add a menu one tab here and then we'll choose to configure it, select items to register. And now you can see I can go through a long list of every single menu item here. So if you find yourself regularly changing the image quality, you might add that to my menu. And what else do we usually change? We will often format pictures. Oh, I use the interval timer all the time. So I'll turn on, I'll add that. Um, in video mode, I will often have to go in and change the audio levels. So I just went past that. Sound recording, so I'll add that. And I'll hit menu to back up. But now you can see my menu here now has three different menu items. So I don't have to dig through each of the different tabs anymore. I can just go right to my menu here and pick the menu item. It just makes it so much easier. That covers my tutorial for the Canon 5D Mark IV. Now I'm gonna go over my favorite accessories for it, both software and hardware. Up first, Adobe Lightroom. Lightroom processes your, ingests all of your pictures. So you insert your memory card into the computer and then it will pull in your thousands of pictures, render previews for them, and allow you to do basic editing like changing the exposure, cropping, rotating, leveling, even fixing some blemishes and such. Lightroom is kind of a necessity. It's slow as heck, but I still think it's the best software out there. Uh, I suggest getting the Lightroom CC deal, the Creative Cloud deal, because that's the only way you get new updates for it. You can get it from sdp.io slash Adobe deal with Photoshop, and in the US, it's usually about 10 bucks a month. Let's talk lenses. For general shooting, my favorite lens is the Canon 24 to 70 f2.8. This is one of the sharpest zoom lenses ever made. It's absolutely exceptional. Uh, it's also quite fast at f2.8, making it good for events, things like wedding receptions where you're shooting indoors in kind of low light. It's basically the best thing there is. Unfortunately, it's not image stabilized. There is no image stabilized version of it in the Canon world, um, unless you go for the Tamron version. I still like the Canon better um, because it, well, there has a few minor differences like it doesn't have focus breathing. Anyway, the Canon is my recommendation. You can pick it up from the link down here and we get a few pennies out of every dollar that you spend. For video, as I mentioned earlier, I recommend the Canon 16 to 35 F4 because I shoot 4K video. That means I get basically a 1.8X crop, which means I need to be shooting with a super wide angle lens to be a normal wide angle lens. It's also image stabilized, which is really important for any sort of run and gun video shooting handheld or even on a monopod, that image stabilization helps. If you're a landscape photographer and you want to shoot ultra wides, the Canon 11 to 24 just can't be beat. It's an F4 lens. There's no image stabilization and it's exceptionally pricey, but it's super sharp and it's an 11 millimeter zoom. It can shoot as wide as you might ever need. Basically you can get it from sdp.io slash C11. If you're doing portraits, this is an unbeatable lens. It's the Canon. 24 or Canon 70 to 200 F2.8. I have a teleconverter on here now because I was shooting sports with it. It's very sharp. It has no focus breathing. And it's this lens is the reason we stay in the Canon system. It's a spectacular, spectacular lens. If you're shooting sports more than portraits, you could also consider the Tamron 70 to 200 F2.8. It's even sharper, but it shrinks significantly when you're shooting close up portraits. This lens does not have focus breathing. It's been an important criteria for us. We love that lens. Um, a couple of teleconverters are terribly useful with the 70 to 200. So if you pick that up, you might want to pick up the 1.4x or 2x teleconverters. It still continues to be quite sharp because it's a really high quality lens. You can use these links here. The 1.4x teleconverter will turn it into um, like a 
what is it, 100 to 280 millimeter or so lens, and the 2X teleconverter will turn it into a 140 to 400 millimeter f5.6 lens. If you're shooting sports and you have some money to throw around, check out the Canon 200 to 400 millimeter f4 lens. It's expensive, but it's fantastic. It's extremely sharp and fast, and it has a lot of reach. It also has a built-in 1.4x teleconverter, so you can get out to like 560 millimeters and f5.6, which is great. It's also good even for wildlife stuff. If you just want an inexpensive wildlife lens, this lens, you can pick it up for about a grand, maybe a little bit less. I would even find a used version because they're extremely durable. The Canon 400mm f5.6 Prime. This is an old lens. It's got to be 13 years old now, but we've been using it this whole time, and it cannot be beat at that price point. No image stabilization, but for things like moving birds, it works spectacularly, and you usually don't have too much of a need for image stabilization with high shutter speeds. Anyway, scp.io slash c400. Another good wildlife lens that is stabilized and a little more versatile. It's actually a hair sharper, but way more expensive, is the Canon 100 to 400 millimeter Mark II zoom. Do not get the Mark I zoom. It had appalling image quality. We found this version to be much, much better. Pick it up at the link here. If you're serious about wildlife, well, first, I would probably push you towards a 70 Mark II because you'll get even better images, or maybe a Canon 5DSR as the body. But for lenses, you cannot beat the Canon 600mm f4. You're looking at about 13 grand for it, but it's spectacular. It will produce results that simply cannot be beat. If you're shooting video, a good mic is critical. For interview style things or anyone where you're filming somebody talking, our favorite lab mic is the Sennheiser. EW100 G3. That's what I'm using now. You can pick it up from this link here. You can also save yourself a few bucks and pick up a G2 used. If you want to order prints, we have a whole video that tests, tested all the major printers in the United States. Visit sdp.io slash print it to see that. If you're looking for a tripod, I would recommend this cheap $50 tripod from Dolica. Pick it up at this link here. But I also wanted to recommend a higher end Manfrotto tripod, one that we actually tend to use on a regular basis, which is, oh, it's cleverly named, right? MK190X Pro 4-BHQ2. Those Italians and their clever naming. Anyway, you can use this link down here to check it out, but it's an excellent functional tripod. It's a little bit bigger than a travel tripod, but generally bigger and heavier tripods are better to use as long as you don't have to carry it with you for many miles. The Canon flashes, especially the 600 EXRT, they're excellent. But they're also very, very expensive and kind of unnecessarily so. If you just want a cheap on-camera flash, I'll recommend the Yongno YN568EX2. It pretty accurately simulates the like non-radio controlled Canon flashes at a much, much lower price point. So play with this and see if it gets the job done for you before you start dropping five, six hundred bucks on Canon flashes. Before my voice gives out, one last plug. For my books, Stunning Digital Photography teaches you all the photographic things you need to know beyond the buttons and dials on your cameras. I teach you the art of photography, posing, mood, expression, the things that really make a difference in your photography. And heck, you spent 3400 bucks on a camera body, you could spend 10 20 bucks on some knowledge, right? Some education. If you're baffled by all the different lens options, flash options, studio lighting, how to build out a studio, uh, anything gear related is covered in my photography buying guide with tons and tons of video in it. My Photoshop book, when you get serious about your post-processing, you want to make your pictures, your portraits, your landscapes perfect, you will definitely be using Photoshop. This book is cheap and it has 10 hours of video. And of course, for those processing your pictures in Lightroom, I have a book on that too. Pick up any of those from our store at scp.io slash store, or just go to Amazon. Go to Amazon and look at the reviews for the books. You don't have to take my word for it. Other people will tell you their experiences with the books. The reviews are good. Then you can get it directly from us at sdp.io slash store. That wraps it up. Share with your friends. Subscribe to see more photography videos. We teach photography and we review lots of gear. We look at your pictures live every Thursday at 5 o'clock. We'll actually give you feedback if you tune into the live show. Share with your friends. Thanks and bye.